Hello and welcome to the Booktopia podcast. It's a podcast about books and the brilliant people who read them and write them. My name's Ben Hunter. I'm Booktopia's fiction category manager. I'm here today with Joe Lewin, Booktopia's head of trade books. Hi, Joe. Hey, Ben. And today we're going to be interviewing Claire Thomas. Uh, she's a Melbourne based writer. Her acclaimed first novel was uh, The Fugitive, uh, Fugitive Blue. It was long listed for the Miles Franklin Award. Claire has a PhD from University of Melbourne and she teaches literary studies and creative writing. Her new novel has been listed as one of the most anticipated books of 2021. It's called The Performance. Welcome to the Booktopia podcast, Claire. Thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure. Um, Joe and I have both really enjoyed reading this book. It's one of those um, small, not tiny, but small but potent novels that packs so much in. It's all set over one night uh, in which three women separately watch a play. Um, but it's not just any play and it, they're not just any women and it's not just any night, uh, is it, Claire? It's something much more potent than that. Well, yes, potentially. Um, there <laughs> is, we, there is a bushfire developing on the outskirts of the city as these women arrive at the theatre. Um, and so there's, there's that sort of literal and metaphorical kind of threat looming throughout um, the novel. But it takes place as they're at, at the beginning of the play and it, and it ends as the play um, is completed. And um, there are varying degrees of um, distraction around what's happening outside. Some of them are very ensconced in the moment inside the theatre. Um, but yes, it's a, it's an unusual night for that reason. <laughs> yeah, it, it certainly is. It's beautiful the way with the bushfire raging outside um, and they all come in from the bushfire and, and I guess with the exception of one of the characters who's got a real personal connection to the bushfires, for everyone else within the theatre, it's really like an, a, an oasis of like... Yes. ..calm and cool and thinking of something other than the world being on fire. Yes, and, th and that's also got its problems in that there's this little bubble of air condition privilege that they can kind of encapsulate themselves inside and they're able to um, mm. turn away from certain realities. Mm. Um, so mm. I was kind of wanted to play with that idea as well. And, and one of them, particularly um, Margot, the older woman of the three, um, she complains about being too cold the air conditioning is you know annoying her and then she's got a tickly throat because it's it, because of the cold air and, and it's this weird kind of disconnect between mm. the um the cultural experience and what's happening outside and yeah it permeates a lot for one of them as you say yes yeah <laughs> margot in particularly i you 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 start with margot in, in a in a strong way and that really resonated with me Claire, this idea of um, going into the theatre and entering, you know, the lights go down and you enter this kind of um, hypersensitive meditation mm. almost, um, especially mm. when you're in a packed out playhouse. Um, there's the sounds of the people around you, um, uh, an itchy throat or the feeling of a handbag bundled in your lap can just become so much greater than yes. you would ever it just takes on a real significance um in the, the sort of bubble life of an audience member um well, at, yeah, yeah go on go on no i was going to say i kind of the thing about the theater is it forces them to sit there you know yeah they, so i guess i could have written something similar if someone had just sat down at their kitchen table and thought for a while but um i wanted the, the device of the theater um yeah, it both encloses them and, and, you know, isolates them, but then also it frees their minds because they're, they're there and they can, yeah. they can watch what's going on or they can just, um, you know, they can go anywhere you know, yeah. intellectually. And, and the stuff with the other people, that was um, always uh, something that I really was interested in because it's such a false sort of intimacy sitting in a theatre like that and you're so close and, um, you know, but 
you're absolutely not watching the same thing. You know, no, you don't, you have no idea how the person next to you is perceiving it or, you know, why they, they're behaving in the way that they are. If they're, if they're laughing or crying or, mm. or you know. Yeah. I mean, I'm, Margot is perceiving a woman in a mound and her marriage. Yeah. And, you know, Ivy is perceiving a woman in, her, in a mound and, you know, her, her career and the changes that have happened over her life. And Summer is almost not in the theatre at all. Yeah. She's either, yes, she's kind of, very, everything's extremely heightened for, mm. for Summer. Um, and, yeah, so she's, she kind of fluctuates from being absolutely fixated to what's going on. Um, and then, yeah, as you say, it's almost like... Being there. It's almost like Margot and Ivy, for them, it's an escape and it's a freedom from everything else that's going on in their life. And for, for Summer, it's almost like a prison. You know, there's so many other things that she needds to be doing and she has right. to be there. Yeah, and she can't communicate with the person she wants to communicate with properly. So, again, it's that sort of sense of entrapment um, that can work in different ways. Um, yeah. Claire, can you talk to us about your own experiences of, the theatre is it a big part of your life um where do you like to go what do you like to watch <laughs> i would say it as a audience member i love going to the theatre honestly i find it financially quite prohibitive to go a lot um but i try to go um you know sometimes um and I did a lot of acting when I was younger um, and before that I did a lot of dance. I was a ballet dancer as a kid and so I, um, yeah, so I, I'm maybe more comfortable on the stage than looking at the stage, but, well, in terms of my experiences, but I definitely um, think that theatre has got, really extraordinary and kind of precious qualities that I, um, that I've sort of touched on already in terms of that, the intimacy and the, the, the precariousness of it. You just have no idea what's going to happen on stage or beside, you know, with the people, if there's just a whole lot of people in a room and you know, what could go wrong? Um, yeah. Um, and the, the play that, um, these three women are watching mm. is, is Happy Days by yes. Samuel Beckett, the famous absurdist. Mm -hmm. uh, and his his plays are unique. <laughs> um, why why have you chosen this play, yes. and um, and what's what's significant about that? Um, look, there are a couple of reasons why I chose this play. One of them was a sort of a pragmatic, crafty one, which was about it, it's quite the the setup is so incredibly strong, and uh, the business of the play is very clear. You know, it's just and the you know it's essentially one woman and, and then a man. So it's, it's very easy to explain. I didn't want it to be complicated um, theatrically that, um, so there was that, but also I, I've seen this play. It, I thought it was incredible. Um, it's got so much in it and I, I kind of, was able to just pull out little tiny bits from it and do whatever I wanted with them. I feel there's so much in the play. There's so much language. There's so many ideas. There's, there's so many directions that Winnie's uh, speech sort of goes in um, that I feel you, someone else could write a completely different novel centered around mm. the same play. It's sort of That's like, right. whereas if the play was out. a very, if the play was a very literal, yes. Um, straightforward story straightforward right. narrative it makes it very difficult to adapt to everybody and yes. to apply to everybody that's right and different um yeah so there were so many different aspects of it that were able to resonate and kind of trigger things with each of them um yeah and i also just think that central concept of a woman buried in a mound of earth um, is so incredibly rich as, you know, an image and a metaphor, obviously. <laughs> I've certainly used it. <laughs> yeah, certainly. <laughs> um, 
Uh, in terms of other influences, uh, what do you like to read? Um, who are your big uh, novel influences? I thought you might ask me that. Mm. And I've got, look, I go through phases. I'm, um, rec- maybe I'll just talk about what I've been doing recently. Mm. Um, I've been going in a bit of a kind of intense French vein. So um, Annie Erno, like little tiny perfectly formed um, emotional books by French women. It's a branch of thing I'm interested in. Um, I read Unquiet by Lynn Ullman recently, which was fascinating um, as well. I love um, Valeria Luiselli, um, Mexican American writer. Um, God, I, I feel like Sigrid Nunez and Ali Smith. I've really oh yeah. Feel and Louis Sally, like, was that the Lost Children archive? Yes, was that, that, novel? that yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. And then I read that, and then I've gone back and read all her others because I was, I just thought that was so um, formally exciting as well as emotionally incredibly effective. Um, yeah. I mean, I could go on forever about books, but <laughs> so could we? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <But that's>, um, <laughs> Occupational hazard, huh? Yes. Well, no, it's great. We wouldn't want it any other way. Yeah, I couldn't handle it any other way. So how does it feel, I guess, for for people who missed it at the beginning, you also teach creative writing at university level. How does Um, it feel? um, Is that, sorry, is that correct? Well, I was going to say, I think we're, I think we're at the past tense of that now. Um, Oh, okay. I'm edging away. Edging Mm -hmm. away. Good for you. Yeah. How does it feel, (laughs) um, you know, having critiqued so many other people's work having mm. to apply that same uh, discipline to your own? Um, look, there, were, there was quite a while there where I had convinced myself that I was a professional reader, not a writer. Like I'm, a, I'm good at reading properly mm. and because that's what I was doing all the time. And, um, but I think I'm, I'm pretty good at, Oh, I don't know. I don't want to sort of sound too conceited here, but I feel like I was. No, you own I, your talent. I turned my own hypercritical eye to my mm. own work, and it was an arduous process. But I, you know, there's a reason why it's been a long time. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I knew. I, I think I trust my judgment, mm. and I trusted my judgment when I was writing and working on this book too. Um, Mm. So I had a strong um, clarity and around that stuff. I don't find it difficult to cut things and change things and make calls about that. Once I knew what I, once I got into the, once I had momentum and knew what Mm. I was doing and had the voices and the the whole thing. And I think that really comes across, Claire. I mean, there's not, Mm. um, there's not an extra word. There's not an extra thought or an extra plot twist in this that isn't essential to the character development and the plot. Oh, um, you. you can really see the the care and attention that's gone into making every phrase relevant. Yeah, I like um, distilled language. Mm. I like... Um, and there's a lot of reasons why I made those sorts of choices for this particular book. Um, but yeah. You, you also, you also just go a long way with not a lot of action. <laughs> no, there's no action. I mean, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's the thing. It's there. It's literally all going on in their heads. And that was the challenge, I suppose, because they're to create any kind of narrative um, momentum or just, you know, intellectual mobility or anything because it is, it, um, yeah. But I think it's that kind of paradoxical aspect of being stuck but then being free to think about anything. Yes. And that, and that brings me back to Beckett again, mm. <laughs> right? Yep. It's, that, um, it's that glory of, of how much the, the viewer can, can bring to the work. Um, Definitely, yeah. And they've all got different relationships with the play. You know, one, you know, one of them's quite a fan, a Beckett fan, and has done the sort of, 
you know, the literary tourism stuff, just gone to his grave and his house and, um, and then Summer sort of was a bit shocked when she saw the play because she thought Beckett was just all old, crusty old men complaining about being alive, is I think something that she says. Um, and then Margot, who's older and is a literature professor, is quite dismissive of Beckett, really. Mm. But, yeah, the, the play still works on her in some way. It certainly does. Yeah. Um, uh, something I also that sort of has been ringing in my head reading this is... And, I imagine this book has, has been a lot more than one year in the making. Um, but it, it, it strikes me as no happy accident that uh, a novel that is incredibly interior and about the isolated inner worlds of mm. women, um, mm-hmm. uh, I, to, to think of that novel being worked on uh, during the lockdowns of the last 12 months, uh, do, do you think? that the pandemic has affected your work and not just in a practical sense, but like in terms of the kind of novel you've created? Um, To be honest, it's kind of going to have more of an impact for future stuff. I was very much at the point of, I'm not going to write a pandemic novel. It's okay. Don't worry. But, um, (laughs) (laughs) but, um, but I was quite a long way along. I think with this, I was just, yeah, we were we were doing very final. We we're at final stages, and um, I actually had very little solitude and in an interior life during the pandemic because I've got too many children, <laughs> and I had I was like I couldn't have any time alone in a room, you know. So um, it was almost like this magical memory of um, having a train of thought you know Mm. um but i was also i think it's i think the pandemic will have an impact on the way the book's read because i think certain things like just theater like we haven't still haven't got that back in melbourne in the same way um and just that weirdness of being so close to people and like Mm. someone coughing or breathing or you can smell them you know all Mm. that stuff is that that seems odder now i think once we're all so hyper aware of our kind of um, personal boundaries and and that's something that I really um, wanted. There's a lot of kind of play around that idea in the book about like what's contained and what's not. And yeah, and but also um, the idea of how how um, what a wonderful privilege it is to go to the theatre mm-hmm. and you know some it's it's a an art form that we need to treasure. We've had, you know, 12 yes. months without it. Yes. Um, and, yes. you know, reading that book, I was like, oh, yeah, remember that? Yes. That was nice, wasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. It, <laughs> it seems, yeah, there's a nostalgic aspect that mm. we certainly didn't know was going to be there when I was writing it. But, um, yeah, it is a, a, a special and unique kind of experience um, that can't be replicated by a recording on, you know, of, a, of, a, of an actor sort of talking mm. to a screen. I mean, it's a di- very different kind of thing. It's the energy in the room, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And, yes, that's everything. That's everything with theatre. Yeah. Can you allude to um, uh, these future projects? Uh, uh, can you uh, illuminate us on, on those um, in any way, shape or form? Oh, I'm very not clear. Uh, I, was <laughs> very, I was very far along. Well, I sh- yeah, I was very far along within, within the next... Thing and I ditched the whole project just recently because there was Ouch. something else. No, it was great. I was like, oh, oh stuff oh, good. that. Congratulations. A, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's because I've got a better, a better thing that I'm finding much more. Um, yeah, I was just like, no. So I've, I'm doing something completely different now, but I'm very excited. But um, yeah, it's still. Yes, I'm sorry. I'm being very vague. My, I, I was having this conversation with my US publisher the other day, and I couldn't even come up with an adjective about the next project. Just like, just any adjective. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Sorry. <laughs> there's there's so much anticipation about this book, mm-hmm. uh, the performance, uh, and there's a, a lot of um, endorsements coming out. People are yeah. uh, as, as saying how how. how uh, uh, exhilarated they have been by this, this small novel. Uh, and there's comparisons to Charlotte Wood, which I think are really obvious um, structurally and in terms of the, 
the um, mood and the, the level of wit at which you exhibit in your writing. Um, who do you think is the ideal person to read this book, Claire? Oh, wow. Um, any intelligent human. I was going to say woman, <laughs> but then I thought, hang on, I'm talking to you. So I, yeah. um, I definitely was writing with smart women in my mind. That was the only people I was really going to. And if it moves beyond those boundaries, that's fine. <laughs> um, but I think because it's got a 20 something and a 40 something and a 70 something, um, that wasn't a deliberate kind of um, pledge to be marketable, but I, I feel like that will have, it does have that kind of cross generational mm. appeal. Um, and I, I hope that readers will be able to come at it from lots of different sort of um, directions. And I don't think you need to have, know a single thing about the play, for example, or if you did know a lot about the play, that would add another layer. So I think, yeah. Um, the two, I've dedicated the book to my two best friends and I'd say they were my ideal readers. And Absolutely. Um, They've been pleased. I've got, I've had, I've had positive feedback from them. So that's I'm good. like, okay, well, that's my, my job here is done. They yeah. were the two people that I uh, really wanted to um, write it for. And so, yeah. That's so if you were, if you were thinking when you were writing that yeah. you were writing for intelligent women, yep. um, do you think the book is women's fiction? Do you think women's fiction is still a thing? Oh, God. Um, yes, because men are less interested in women's consciousness. And, I mean, that's a huge generalisation. I don't really like any such terms. And, I no, I mean, it's about human beings. But hmm. the, the fact of their womanhood is a big part of the, their lived experiences. And um, we there's not we're not in some sort of post world where that's not true, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, and so I don't think it's in a sort of subcategory and I'm very, very happy to welcome male readers as well. Absolutely. That's what I was kind <laughs> of alluding to. Because and to I have me, had some positive things from yeah. male readers. Yeah. Yeah. And to me, the idea of clever men reading more books like this, uh, yep helps to make them better. Absolutely. It helps to make <laughs> well the men better. Oh, this, okay. this is good. Of course, he's already wonderful. Oh, well, he's an unusual. <laughs> I think it's because he's read so much Charlotte yes. Wood. Yeah. <laughs> and Claire Thomas now. Um, and Claire Thomas. Uh, um, no, you're, you're absolutely right, Joe. And um, I, I, I would definitely recommend this book for blokes as well as yes. women and everyone. Um, I just think it's glorious and I, I'm thrilled for you. I can't wait for people to read this thing. I'm happy to be selling Thank it. Thank you. Thank you. That's lovely. Yeah, I think that I'm, I'm really looking forward to this getting all of the critical acclaim it oh. deserves. We're, we're so behind this one for you. Thank you. Yes, it's a, it's a clever book that has um, a lot to connect with. Um, Claire, thank you for spending some time with us today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. Uh, the performance is published by Hachette and you can buy it and all of Claire's books at booktopia.com.au. Thank you for listening to the Booktopia podcast channel. Don't forget, you can subscribe to us on SoundCloud and iTunes for free and get access to hundreds of author discussions, book analysis pieces, and more. Or, if your eyes need a workout, head to Booktopia TV on YouTube. Don't forget, for all books featured in this podcast, and for access to a whole bunch of other fun content on our blog, head to Booktopia, Australia's local bookstore, at booktopia.com.au.